Welcome back to Legal Principles of Surveying, Spring 2014. I am Mr. Chris Riles, your instructor at East Central Community College in Decatur, Mississippi. We are coming out of Chapter 4 of Brown's Boundary Control and Legal Principles, and today we're talking about the principles of boundary law. Now, the roles of law and technology are very prominent with regard to boundaries, from their initial creation to their subsequent retracement and to their modification and alteration through legal doctrines. What this states basically is, is that we are in charge of retracing and uh, finding evidence of boundaries. But the surveyor should not practice law or give legal advice. That is relegated to the courts, to lawyers, to people who are much more familiar with the law than a surveyor. The role of a surveyor is instead to collect and present evidence in the event that boundaries need to be de described or retraced. This lecture will be presented based on information imparted to surveyors, not legal professionals. If you're going into real estate law, there's going to be a lot more details that you're going to need. But since we're talking about boundary law for the surveyors, this lecture should suffice. Now, the main function of the surveyor in the law is to collect and present evidence of measurements, prior surveys, monumentation, testimony, identification of possession, and sometimes even the opinion of the surveyor. These actions must be carried out in a professional manner, which means we uphold ethical and moral standards of conduct, and we use good, repeatable methods of data collection. Any information that a surveyor collector obtains can be called for in a court proceeding and be submitted as evidence. This includes field notes, digital data, drawings, research, notes you wrote on a napkin from Sonic, this means anything. So when we're conducting a survey, you're pursuing evidence, you're looking for reasons behind um, ownership and transfer of title and boundaries. It's important to know that your main function is to gather this information. And we must do it in such a way that it can be repeated and followed and looked back at effectively. Okay, that's, that's really the important part of this because everything that we do can be scrutinized in a court of law if we're ever called to the courts. So, there are five basic areas of law to think about when we are surveying. The first is constitutional law. And yeah, the Constitution has something to do with surveying. It's kind of interesting. We'll talk about that. This is under the distribution exercise of governmental power. Now, this could be either state constitutions or federal, but typically when we talk about constitutional law, we're discussing federal law. Statute law. Laws enacted by a legislative body. Once again, this is mostly state law, but it can also be federal law. Common law. This law is the lex loci, um, the common law, the local law. It can, it's derived from customs of early England. Um, kind of unwritten rules, but laws that are basically the rights of man, and it involves a lot about ownership. Um, talking about the fact that um, possession is nine-tenths of the law, that phrase actually came from common law. Case law, which is described by former case outcomes. Um, for instance, so-and-so said this in a case, well then that's going to be a precedent for future cases. And then we also have administrative law that's created by administrative agencies of the federal government. Your FBI, EPA, BLM, so on and so forth. Talking about the U.S. Constitution and real property. Amendments 3, 4, and 5 relate to the pro government's power against private property. Amendment 5 states that a criminal cannot be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. This also protects private property from being taken for public use without just compensation. The eminent domain is that doctrine that we've talked about a little bit briefly before, but it's that doctrine that private lands can be taken for public good. Now, Amendment 5 here in the U.S. Constitution prohibits this from being taken unless the landowner is justly compensated for their lands. So in other words, the government can't just come take it. There has to be some kind of reasoning and compensation for seizure of that land. Now, to talk a little bit about eminent domain, people get all twisted up about eminent domain and get excited and scared about it. Really, eminent domain is a rare thing. It doesn't happen as often as you would think compared to other legal actions against land. According to your book, eminent domain is the authority and power of the sovereign to take private property or rights 
in property for public use without the owner's consent. Now, even though you may not have consent, it still has to be justly compensated for. In many cases, the land is obtained through a court or through a legislation via a court. Um, the concept is you get a group of people together to decide whether it is for the public good. And that's kind of the concept here is the public good of property. The portion of the Constitution that gives the federal government rights to seize land, but done with just compensation once again. This is left up to the states and local municipalities when it pertains to state or local government lands for public use. So it really depends on where you are. And the laws differ based on municipality, state, county, but also on federal level. So, so depending on the type of land that's being eminently domained and the purpose behind which the land is being eminently domained will depend on where it falls and what kind of law it falls under. Now, we'll briefly show you a little bit about the Mississippi Code with eminent domain. You can look that up yourself. Um, but if you want to look at Mississippi's eminent domain laws, there's a lot of laws with it. That doesn't include all the laws that are local. And Like if I live in the town of Decatur, Mississippi, there's probably some different eminent domain statutes than there are in other towns. Okay? Now this has caused conflict in the past with many landowners, especially when the interstate highways were being built. Many times interstate highway land was eminently domained so the interstate highway could be built. Well, people were compensated at the time for the land, but had they known the value of the land as the time went on, uh, they'd have probably wanted more for the land. So, eminent domain is still a sore subject for many, many people. Now, the concept of just compensation, it's been held that just compensation is the current fair market value of the land. It, each state has its own determination of what fair market value means, but some of the factors could include use, demand for similar property improvements, or additions to the property. In a state of Mississippi, demand for the similar property is the, the main one. Um, what has the property nearby sold for in the past? And that can give me an idea of what the fair market value of the land is. It can also be defined by what price the buyer or grantor is willing to pay at the time of the sale of the property. If I have someone willing to pay $2,000 an acre at the time of sale, and they're willing to pay that without me twisting their arm, well, that could be the fair market value of the land. And, and so, you know, it depends on where you are and where you're from, what uh, just compensation actually is. But in many cases, this is the way just compensation could be defined by these factors. Now, this is part of the Mississippi Code. The parts that are in red kind of give you an idea that it's not just the government coming and taking Mississippi State, um, coming and just taking land, but rather it's a judge, jury, and other officers, um, officials, and personnel. And they, they get this, this jurisdiction and power from the government via this special court. Okay, And each county has elected to come under those provisions. And, and being based on those provisions, then different laws and things can come under the, the jurisdiction of the Mississippi Code, having that they've accepted those things. So this is just a piece of the code here talking about the court, but there's a lot of other information about eminent domain, and I would really encourage you to look it up. If you go to this website, this LexisNexis.com, Hot Topics and MS Code, you can then search the code and look for different parts of eminent domain. It's a really neat website. I encourage you to check it out. The question of jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is the right and power of a court to adjudicate or pass final judgment concerning a subject matter in a given case. Now what this means is the jurisdiction of a different court depends on, one, the authority of the law by the particular court, whether they are a um, civil court or a criminal court, the location of the dispute or matter, where is it located, which county, which state, you know, which country, and the particular matter in dispute, if it is a matter of um, trespassing, you know, if it's a matter of encroachment, if it's a matter of fraud, all those things, all, all of that can come back to these three things. And so it's, what's the authority of the court? Where is the matter being discussed and disputed at? And what is the particular matter about? For instance, if the dispute is over a boundary between two states, this is no longer going to be a state matter, but rather a federal matter, because it involves more than one state. 
In this case, the federal government is the next step up in the hierarchy, and the federal courts would then decide on the matter because it was the federal government that decided on the boundary in the first place. Every state that has been created sent off their macro boundaries, once again we have that term, macro boundaries, to a federal legislative body, being the Congress, and the Congress then enacted a act that caused that portion of property, that boundary, to become a state. Well, since the federal government put it out, they're the ones that maintain the corrections for it. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a dispute about the line between Texas, um, I think it was between Texas and Oklahoma, there was a dispute about the line there. I've heard disputes about Louisiana and Mississippi along the Mississippi River, where the changes of the river have, have shifted and moved, and even on some topographical maps you can see those changes. But it's important to realize this is going to become a federal matter, not a state matter. Anything that applies to federal lands is going to refer back to a federal court. This involves Indian reservations, national parks, refuges, public domain lands, um, anything like that that is federally owned, uh, even like military properties and such, are going to go to federal court. Because if the federal people own it, it's going to go to federal court. State owns it, state court. Local, local. Once lands are privately owned, state law then dictates the overall concept of those privately owned lands. Now, a federal or state agency, is, if they're involved in the dispute, it may be sent to federal court for a decision because in a lot of cases when the federal government is sued or involved in a suit or a, a legal dispute, they're going to refer back to the Supreme Court or a federal court. Um, state law will be followed for lands that are, not own, that are owned by private citizens, however, not federal law. So if we have dispute between two private citizens, state law is going to decide that. And you will see that throughout surveying that in a lot of cases it's based on states. That's why you have to be licensed in different states because the law is different from state to state. Now, that's all roughly the same, but there are some major differences between state laws and even look in Mississippi and Alabama, two states that are very close to each other. There are very big differences in their law and how they go about looking at the law. When you're practicing in a particular state, it is your responsibility to research that state's law regarding surveying. If you don't do that research, you're going to be in a heap of trouble. Some states, including Mississippi, have a set of minimum standards or standards of practice for surveyors. All work conducted in these states must meet these standards. If you don't follow these standards and you don't use those standards, then you're going to be in a lot of trouble because you're going to miss the mark that has been set, the bar that has been set by that state's governmental bodies. Once again, this concept of a surveyor using the law but not being uh, a, a lawyer or giving legal advice is true. Look over here under the graphic. A surveyor should be knowledgeable of the laws that affect his or her work, but the surveyor should never practice law, not practice law, or give legal advice because that's not your job. Remember, your job is to research, find evidence, retrace, and submit. That's your job. So a little bit of discussion about minimum standards. In 1991, Mississippi enacted the minimum standards of surveying. And this document applied to plats and that were created on surveys. Now, plats are basically maps of surveys designed to, designed to show all the required information to examine or retrace the survey. They also show graphically the extent of the rights that are being conveyed to an individual. And these are very important in our field. Some states even require you to submit these documents to your local courthouses. Mississippi, however, is not one of those states. It's not required. You can, but it's not required. On July 1, 2005, a new set of standards was created and developed called the Standards of Practice. Now, you may still hear me call it Minimum Standards of Survey because when I learned it was the Mississippi Minimum Standards. Standards of Practice is the term that is supposed to be used today. Okay, and These standards dictate the required elements on plats and therefore some of the methods of the practicing surveyor because all surveys from this date forward must meet these standards. And a lot of these standards go directly back to concepts relating to making sure that you gather enough evidence to prove what you're doing. So what I want you to do is look under the lecture slides and handouts module for legal principles in Canvas and click on the Mississippi Minimum Standards link. Now this brings up the Mississippi Board of Professional Engineers and Surveyors website 
and it's updated quite regularly with a lot of different types of information, including legal action taken against certain surveyors, um, new people who've gotten their license, people who've passed the first uh, fundamentals exam, um, information on laws, information on changes in the laws, all of that kind of stuff. And if you're planning on becoming a professional surveyor, it's really important that you read and understand the terminology in these standards. These standards are maintained by the legislative bodies, but they are also put on the website by the professional engineers and surveyors of Mississippi. Now, a little bit about licenses. If you don't follow the standards of practice, you can lose your license. Not to mention legal action taken against you by landowners or other parties or even the state can take action against you. So you want to make sure that you know these standards and you read these standards because this once again comes back to boundary law in the state of Mississippi. Now we're going to read through the standards. Um, if you would print off the standards of practice after June 2005, um, if you'll print those off, just pause this video and print them. We're going. I'm going to go through them and it would be really helpful if you had a copy to look at so as I read through it you will see what I'm talking about when I talk about the different information. Okay. Alright, so how to use the standards. They're labeled A through P. Um, most of the requirements pertain to the amount and format of the data and the information that you put on the plat, but some require to methods of data collection, and that's the ones that are really important when it comes to boundary law. Because remember, in boundary law, what do we do? We're here just to retrace, just to follow, just to look at. We're not here to do anything else. And so I would suggest you study these standards at length before you tackle a solo survey. You really need to read this information and get a good idea of what will be required in your methods of collection. All right, so let's start with the requirement A. I'm not gonna read all the requirements, but I'll read little pieces out of it. Requirement A talks about the size of the plat. The plat can be no smaller than a letter sheet of paper, eight and a half by 11, or for you drafting geeks, an A size sheet. This is just saying that it has to be on durable paper. I can't draw it on a cardboard box. It's two inches by four inches. It has to be something durable, something that could be submitted, something that looks good. Okay. Requirement B, the plant should show the scale, area, and classification of the survey. Um, these are classifications are based on um, the value of the land at the time of the survey, but also the purposes for which the property is being used. The classification must be based on criteria in Appendix A. And if you look at Appendix A, it should be the very last sheet of your um Standards, it talks about the different classes of surveys, like Class A surveys are extensively developed in expensive properties. This would be like if you're surveying for a Walmart or a new McDonald's, okay? You really want the requirements of the scale area and the classification to be on that survey. It's important, it's very vital, and it's a standard. You have to have that on there, okay? Your scale must be true. You can't just throw a scale up one to one and, and print it out. It's just not gonna work that way. Also, the area must be shown to the best of your ability. There's no classification about area here, but I would always show my area plus or minus a hundredth of an acre. So it's really important to get precise when it comes to that, okay? Smaller parcels, if it's less than a half acre, I will usually show it in square feet instead. Some people are like, eh, I don't know if I'd do that or not, but I do it just to ensure um, the integrity of the data. Requirement C talks about the reference meridian. Now, your reference meridian is based on how you obtain north. How did I get my direction? This could be done by GPS. This could be done by a um, uh, sunshot. This could be done by uh, reference meridian between two known points. If it's done by GPS, um, it should be stated on the plat whether the bearings are grid or geodetic. That's important. If they're grid bearings based off like a state plane system, then we're not going to consider the curvature of the earth and therefore it's based off just a grid north. Okay. But if we're using geodetic, it's going to also take into account the curvature of the earth. Okay. If you use a horizontal control station of any kind, two controls, you want to make sure that you publish those as well. As well. And that's also included in... Um, portion C, requirement C of the standards of practice, okay? And you can read that um, meridians established by the compass, if they're used, must be properly declinated. You can't just go out there and throw a compass bearing and use it for a survey. Requirement D, all monuments must, either natural or man-made, should be shown on the plat. Um, make sure to describe the monuments as to their material. It's important on the plat that you describe 
all of the things that you find and all of the things that you put out. New monuments must be made or can, of or contain ferrous metal, which means they must be magnetic, and are no smaller than a half inch in diameter and 18 inches long. That's one of the requirements that's put there. Why? Well, 18 inches long is going to take a while for it to rust away into nothing. And a half inch in diameter means that we can probably go back and find it. And that's kind of the concept behind this. Some surveyors have even started taking pictures of the found monumentation and the set monumentation on the plats. These images can be more easily identified by the retracing surveyors and can be readily shown to the courts. If you have a nice camera that has the ability to take pictures with a certain date on it, and you can take pictures of the work that you do, and then you come back and you say, okay, this is what we did in this date, that's really important and helpful. That could help in a lot of ways. Um, not saying that you have to do that, but again, these are just minimum standards. This, you can go beyond this if you want to. But some surveyors have started doing that. Read also about witness corners there. It talks about how a witness corner can be used. Witness corners are used typically when you can't set a corner, like it's going to fall off in the water or somewhere else. So you want to make sure that you check that out. Okay. Requirement E. A plat of a meets and bounds survey must clearly describe and show monument marking of the commencing point and the point of beginning. The POC and the POB must be clearly defined and described on the plat. Commencing point is a well-defined monument point reference to the U.S. public land system or the GLO system. This is really important because remember back we talked about those original surveys? Yeah, those are GLO surveys. Um, or some other recorded subdivision plat recorded or monumented city or county plat or map compatible with the Mississippi statutes for filing a recording of land ownership that is used in a meets and bounds description. It's really important to know that. Points of commencement, they got to be government defined. Points of beginning, those can be surveyor defined. I can find anything as my point of beginning. Okay, But you want to clearly describe and show them on the map. All discrepancies between the recorded and collected data should be clearly noted on the plat. It's important that you show record distance and then you show um, your actual distance or collected distance. Record information you might include from previous surveys, deeds, or other information as you come across in the process of gathering evidence. And this record information is very, very important. You want to make sure that you show all that, especially if there's an inconsistency found, and you want to make sure to show that inconsistency and how that inconsistency comes into play with that boundary. Requirement G, there's a description of any physical boundary placed on or along the boundary line. It should be described. Fences, walls, tree lines, um, all different kinds of things, but any kind of evidence, buildings, monumentation, anything along that boundary that you find, you should show it on the map and then describe exactly what it is. Requirement H, horizontal distance and direction of all lines pertaining to the boundary. This involves legal description. You want to show the distance and direction on every line as specified by the legal description in the survey process. And that's just one of those things that we must do. Requirement I, four elements of all circular curves should be shown. Radius, arc length, cord bearing, and cord length. Now, those of you that have gotten to advanced surveying, we talk about curves and horizontal curves and all that. Those of you who have not, we're going to talk about horizontal curves in the future. Horizontal curves mainly deal with transportation, railroads, highways, roads, and so if you have a road that has a curve on it, you need to show the curve data, especially if that road bounds up against the property in which you're surveying, which a lot of times land does. So it's important that you show that curve and the data about that curve so that if the road is ever moved, you'll be able to tell from the plat. Requirement J, this requires all information pertaining to the creation of legal descriptions are clearly shown on the plat. Some of this information could include um, all the information used by the surveyor, um, point of beginning, course bearings, distances, all of that information must be shown. The plat should be a graphical representation of the legal description. Legal description's words, plat is a picture, basically. Okay. Requirement K. Lot and block are track numbers of adjoining lots. Now, this can be any information about the adjoining land parcels. Um, some surveyors place the names of adjacent landowners on the parcels. It does not require the names, 
but any designation of lot or block or track numbers are very important. Okay. Uh, requirement L: All visible encroachments must be shown. Now, an encroachment is a situation where a property owner violates the rights of an adjacent property owner by breaking the boundary in some way. This can include a, putting a building over the boundary or attempting to move fences, paths, etc. Anything that you find that is a visible encroachment, something's not right about this. You want to show that on the plat. That's, that's just very, very important. Requirement M. All public and private right-of-ways or ROWs or easements which are known, recorded, or observed. Okay, So anything that you find that could be a right-of-way. Now this, this will involve right-of-ways of streets, right-of-ways of public utilities, right-of-ways of other individuals, easements of use, easements of utilities, any of that. You want to show whether they're known, whether they're recorded in the courthouse, or they're just observed. You see and you go, nah, that looks like somebody's been using that as an easement. It's really important to show that. Okay. Requirement N, location of all permanent improvements which are pertinent to the survey with reference to the boundaries. So let's say someone's building a house and the foundation is visible. You can survey the corners of the building with reference to the boundary <coughs> to ensure that encroachment will not incur. Remember, it's more important to get more information than you need so you don't have to go back later. More information, that is a good thing. Now, you then have to decide what information to put on the plat, but more information is better than not enough. Requirement O talks about the state plan coordinate system. Anytime you use state plan coordinates um, to, decide, to designate the geographic position of a point, you must do it in compliance with the law. Now, there is a, uh, if you look there in, in um, requirement O on your sheet, talks about Senate Bill 2131 approved March 29, 1991 and in compliance of item E of this rule. Okay, State plan coordinates should be clearly referenced to the appropriate horizontal datum on the plat. So these are the things that you should include. The zone designation. Which zone are you in? Mississippi, we only have two, east and west. The horizontal and or vertical datum that is used. Which datum did you use? Is it NAD 83, NAD 27? You know, what is it? The method of derivation, how did you come to this point, okay? Did you use the GPS, or did you use a conventional survey, or did you use a monument that was found? How did you get it? All horizontal and vertical control points used. Anytime you used a control point of any kind, you show it on the map, you give the horizontal and vertical controls. Combined or correctional factor. If you have a correctional factor with this, which is going to really involve your scale factor and a, and a convergence factor, um, you really want to include that on there to show them that you did your research and you know these state plane coordinates come from. And then a convergence angle. Once again, very, very important to show on the plat. Okay. Requirement P, which is the last requirement, all your private information, including your name, your address, your date, your field of uh, field survey, signature and seal of your your um, license surveyorship. Another one to include might be your telephone number. Um, any 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 information that is pertaining back to you, even the name of your business, would be important. Okay. So that's kind of all the requirements A through P, talking about the Mississippi Code. Now we're going to get into some boundary law principles in your textbook. So we're moving from the code now back to the textbook. And we're going to talk about these principles. So this is principle one through three, four through six. And now we're going to talk about principle one. Principle one, unless a landowner or person who claims an interest in land or its boundaries is named into a part of action, his or her rights cannot be affected. Action means that they're being called into a court. And as long as their land or boundaries are not part of the court action, their rights cannot be affected. This is absolutely true. It's important that when we apply, develop a plat that all parties involved in the boundary are defined. Uh, if I know that so-and-so owns the boundary on the other side and so-and-so owns the boundary on this side, it's important to note okay, um, that information. Courts will not accept a plat without surrounding landowners to find. It's, it's really important that you define them. It's a part of the evidence hunting to determine the adjacent landowners and their claim. Now, 
Also, any boundaries directly or indirectly affecting adjacent landowners should be clearly shown on the plat. Now, in the state of Mississippi, because of the way we are with our plats, it's not a... It's more one of those things that we put on there as a, a, a form of reassurance of the title. But this is not always something that's necessarily law. This is kind of more of a good method to do. It's important that you show those adjoining landowners. Principle two. When a surveyor creates boundaries, the law dictates how they'll be created and what elements are controlling in their retracement. Now, this comes back to that standards of practice that we talked about. Surveyors are required to follow these standards because they are what we would call state law. Surveyors that do not follow these guidelines can be in danger of losing their license and their reputation. An ethical surveyor will consider all portions of law pertaining to the creation, collection, and representation of those boundaries. This is one of those ethical things where you want to make sure that you just you do your utmost best to present the evidence in a way that's easily understood by the general public. Now, when we talk about what controls, we talked about controls already in this class. Um, controlling elements are defined boundary parts that make up legally defined boundary lines. Distance, direction, monumentation, area, calls, and witness posts and trees. Now, in a later chapter, we'll discuss these elements in detail and how they um, are come about and what how they are affected um, in what controls. Okay. Boundary principle three, boundary law principle three, rather. A surveyor's decisions are based on the evidence available or considered at the time the decision is made. If the evidence changes or if new evidence is discovered or recovered, the surveyor's opinion may change based on this new evidence. Put simply, evidence means everything. A surveyor has the option of changing their opinion based on the newly collected evidence. If something new is found, your opinion may change about the land. Because of the passage of time and or the difficulty in gathering some data, the courts would rather have an opinion change about a boundary than a rule and then rule unfairly against a party. Uh, if you're called into court and you maybe miss something and someone else finds it, you can change your opinion of what happened based on the new evidence that's presented. And that's one of just the law principles that we live by. Principle four, presumptions at law are conditional on the existence of certain facts. Now we do this to avoid liability. Those who rely on presumptions must eliminate contrary possibilities. Now, this is a legal principle in nature, but it does impact decisions that we make. If you decide that a found concrete monument is the boundary corner, and you tie your survey to that corner, you need to find enough evidence to prove the validity of the find. Uh, if you can't prove that that's where it was, um, either by parole evidence or collected evidence from other surveyors or um, definition from other boundary corners, then we may have an issue. It's better to gather more evidence than needed because of the possibility of missing or needing more information later and down the road. Once again, this whole concept of gather as much information as you possibly can, and we do this to avoid liability, to avoid presumptions. And we want to make sure that when we make a presumption and an assumption that we eliminate the contrary possibilities. We want to make sure that it's the best decision that we can possibly make. Principle five, the meets and bounds system of surveys is probably the oldest survey system on which land descriptions are predicated. This goes back to the Babylonian and Egyptian discussion that we had before, but origins of these, origins of these meets and bounds can be traced to some of the greatest ancient empires and kingdoms. Because of this rich history, many cultures and peoples use this system to describe boundaries and still do today around the world. Areas of the U.S. that were owned by and settled by Spanish for instance, use varas for distance, but they still describe their boundaries with a meets and bounds system. Now, more modern descriptions still use this system while following state guidelines and standards. And if you'll remember from the Mississippi um, standards of practice, we talked about the fact that everything has to be tied to a point of commencement and that is a federal corner. So once again, we follow these guidelines, we use meets and bounds, but remember that it's all based off of that point of commencement. Fence, uh, boundary law principle six, the general land office, the GLO, the PLS system of um, surveying land is predicated on federal statutes, but it may have its surveying principles found in early English and Roman methods and surveying principles. 
Now, the PLSS was created federally. We know this. It was created um, 1785 with the Land Ordinance Act. Um, the local surveyor still works for the system, even though it's old, 1785. It's been around a long time. We still work with it because we have to go back to that original survey. That comes back to that concept of, of original boundaries and original lines and surveys that were conducted. The law presumes that these surveys are accurate and binding. You can't change them. Other presumptions include accurate notes, plats, measurements, directions and equipment. You know, we, we can talk about all those things, but if you carefully observe how the PLSS was designed and how it was carried out, you will see inherent issues. It will reveal those things to you. But these are presumed to be negligible in the rule of law. And this is where it comes to a gray area. As surveyors, we want to do the best job of locating things as we possibly can. But when it comes to original surveys, the law tells us what the truth is rather than math. This is one place where math doesn't necessarily lie, but the law says that it does. <laughs> and so you have to make sure that when you're pursuing these surveys and doing these retracements that you really, really want to look at how it's done and carefully observe how the PLSS was designed and used in your area um, for surveys. Now, when we talk about legal changes of boundaries, we talk about how the law can change where boundaries go. In a previous lecture, we talked about boundaries that cannot be changed by the surveyor or the courts. But, by law, landowners can pursue these four statutes with legal counsel to have boundaries changed. And they are agreement, estoppel, acquiescence, and adverse possession. Now note, these, are just, these four are state issues. Each state has a different way of dealing with them. Adverse possession, for instance, in Mississippi is 10 years. In some states, it's more. In some states, it's less. Each state has its own different way of doing things. Now, here we're going to talk about Mississippi as much as we can, but I'm also going to give you just a brief overview of these, these statutes um, as far as the whole U.S., entire nation. Now, agreement generally is a contract between two individuals for a defined extent and purpose. So, for instance... An example of changing boundaries by agreement could be the buying or selling of land. Okay, agreement on the location of an erroneous boundary. So let's. What if we 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 know there's a problem with the boundary? We see there's an issue. Um, we know there's a problem, but we're going to agree on the location and just call it from there. Misconduct or misrepresentation of the boundary definition. Uh, we will agree that yeah, it's in the wrong spot, and we agree on what we do about it. This requires a conversation. Agreement is a two-party deal, or more parties. It agree, it's a, requires a conversation about the boundaries between these two parties, or three or four parties. In the event of an involuntary transfer of title, you know, bankruptcy, foreclosure, we talked about those already, the breach of contract will result in the carrying out of the part of a previous agreement. So, for instance... If uh, A and B have land that bounce up against each other, and they find out that B, you know, uh, his description differs a little bit from A's, and they look, and it's a difference of about 10 feet off the property line. They make an agreement of the location of the line, but it's not recorded anywhere. They just agree to it, and it's it's just a handshake. Well, if the property is involuntary trans involuntarily transferred. It negates the agreement unless the agreement is written in binding. And an agreement is kind of a weird point of the law. Once again, this is law, not surveying. Um, but as surveyors, we have to understand that these things can happen. And people can agree on where they think the boundaries were and or are. Estoppel. Estoppel is a doctrine based on protecting one party from another, which seeks to harm the rights of that party voluntarily. Um... This is a good example here. A sells a parcel of property to B in 1974. B uses this property based on the boundaries defined in 1974. However, in 2002, A finds that the boundaries defined in 1974 were not correct. And A seeks to remove a portion of B's claim from his rights. Well, 
even though he finds that it's incorrect, A cannot take the rights of B. Because the doctrine of estoppel protects the rights of B, even when the boundary could be wrong. Now, this doctrine is complicated. That's a just a generalized example and very specific to every state. If you look at the state of Mississippi's estoppel rules versus the state of Alabama, they are very different. This gets into real estate law, which is a little bit outside the scope of this course, but you may see estoppel come up in some court cases that you may research. Okay, So it's important to look at that. Acquiescence. This is a doctrine of silence. And what I mean by that is an example like this. A places a fence along what he thinks is a boundary between his property and that of B. Well, B notices the location of the fence and sees that it's slightly off the boundary line, but B chooses to say nothing and allows the boundary to be purported as the fence line. It's one of silence. Nothing said, nothing spoken about, things are done, and no issues are brought up. This is called acquiescence. If an issue is not brought up, it will fall under the doctrine of acquiescence. It's important that a landowner regularly walk your boundaries and make any make note of any changes or encroachments. You really want, and even take pictures of, of your boundaries. That's, that's really kind of important in today's day and age. But if you don't say anything about it, the land could pass under acquiescence and change hands very quickly. Okay, This is a legal doctrine once again. It has nothing really to do with surveying, but we need to know about it when we go out in the field what we might expect. Now, a word about adverse possession. We're going to talk about adverse possession, and you may have heard this term before, and you think free land. Well, that's not necessarily the case. In general, the doctrine defines the method of acquiring title by possession for a statutory period. Now, this is in the Mississippi Code, uh, section 15-1-13. Ten years actual adverse possession by any person claiming to be the owner for that time of any land uninterruptedly continued for ten years by occupancy, descent, conveyance, or otherwise, in whatever way um, such occupancy may have been commenced or continued, shall vest in every actual occupant or possessor of such a land full and complete title, saving to persons under a disability of minority or unsoundness of mind the right to sue within ten years after the removal of such disability, as provided in section 15-1-7. However, the saving in favor of persons under disability of unsoundness of mind shall never extend longer than 31 years. The concept here is, is that you can own land by basically taking it from someone hostily. Now, if you take somebody's land for 10 years and you basically trespass and adversely possess their land and they don't interrupt you they don't know. Um, you can then gain this land by federal statute and state statute. But it's not that easy. <laughs> There's a lot more to it than that. Adverse possession must follow the guidelines below. You must actually possess the land. Um, you need to be on it. You must constructively possess the land, which means I did something positive to the land. I cut the grass. I... I in the timber, I did certain things to it, I built a house, you know, I improved the land. You must have continuous possession. You must never be interrupted by anything. Uh, no one can come out and run you off the land or you leave for a period of time. You must be continuously possessed. You must be hostile or notorious. Uh, notorious is the funny word that makes me giggle. You must be trespassing, basically. Yeah, you don't own it, but you're squatting on it. It must be visible or open. You build fences. You 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 drive around on it. You wave at your neighbors and they know you're not supposed to be there. Yeah, visible and open. And it must be distinct individual possession. You own it. At any time during adverse possession over a period of 10 years, you can be arrested and go to jail for trespassing if the landowner catches you. However, if they're not alive anymore and you squat on the land for 10 years, well, adverse possession could actually work for you. That's the end of the lecture for this week. Um, this week you have the quiz four, Principles of Boundary Law. And this next week we have chapter five quiz, Creation of Meets and Bounds and Non-Sectionalized Descriptions. You need to read chapter five and also look at the slides. Um, we have exam one this week. It'll be a proctored exam. 
between February 10th and February 14th. Um, it's going to cover <coughs> chapters 1 through 3 instead of 1 through 4. I posted the study guide and realized that I had kind of messed it up a little bit. So that's what it will cover. You must make arrangements with your local e-learning department to take the exam. I know we have a couple of students from different places. You must do go to your local e-learning department and make a arrangements with them to take the test. Make sure you use a study guide to help you prepare. And no, you may not take any extra materials into the exam. No books, nothing else. If you're going to East Central Community College and you want to take it here on campus, you can click on this link on your module page for East Central um, Canvas and schedule to take a proctored test. I walk through the process. It's very easy. Just kind of walk through, click, pick a date, pick a time, and send it off, and you'll get a reply back from our e-learning department very quickly. I hope you have a great rest of the week, and uh, take care. If you have any questions about the exam, please post to Canvas and let me know. Thank you very much. Have a great week.